So we're going to go ahead and start the Will Robots Take Our Jobs panel. And we'll just go from extreme left back to me. And <laughs> yeah, the no, I, didn't, I didn't mean that. I, no, no I pun intended. It may be accurate once you hear my presentation. So let's do a mic check. Can you? Can Hello? Hello? Oh, OK. So take you know, preferably five minutes. If it needs to go to 10, OK. It's just that we're running a little behind. And I think what's really a value in this session is the interaction between you guys. So um, with that, please, please go ahead. OK. Um, my name is Tim Carter. I'm an attorney. Uh, I have a degree in tax as well as law, but I lost my way and decided to work for the poor instead and uh, primarily in social security disability. But um, on my free time, I have been an advocate of a basic income guarantee. Uh, um, I first published an article supporting it in about 2000, and, and I think it was in 2003. And um, I'm up here, uh, the, the, the group I'm um, aff affiliated with is the Basic Income Earth Network. Uh, although I missed their recent conference, which is just now ending in Seoul. Um, poverty is not a natural disaster, or a natural tragedy, like an earthquake or a disease. Poverty is a human-caused tragedy. It is like government oppression or slavery. Government oppression is caused by um, by the government treating some people differently because of their characteristics or their beliefs and not giving some people due process of law. The solution to that is to treat everyone equally, give everyone due process of law. Slavery is caused by the government recognizing some people as being property. The solution to that, don't recognize people as property. People are not property, people are free. Poverty is caused in a, um, in a property-owning society by laws which um, allow some people to have property and other people don't have enough property to meet their basic needs. In a market society, that means that some people do not have enough cash. It is a poverty is a lack of money. The solution to poverty, give people money. Uh, a, a basic income is an amount of money that is given periodically to everyone on an individual basis with no work requirements, no means testing, and, um, and, no, other, um, and, and no other requirements whatsoever. Um, a basic income is not a strategy for dealing with poverty. A basic income is the abolition of poverty. The movement for a basic income is the abolitionist movement of the 21st century. Um, you wanted me to cut this down, or I can, I was going to go for about ten, seven or eight minutes, but. Why don't we try to get multiple sessions in, you know, okay. if, if you then, need then, more time responding to people, then, then let's, okay, let's really let me, extrapolate. Let, okay, then. Then, then, then let me go to two of the, um, I was, I was going to. I, I had a middle part, but I'll go to the end part where I address two, the two biggest questions about a basic income um, that, that come up are, one, is it affordable? And then two, is it politically feasible? On the affordability issue, um, there are a lot of different proposals for how to pay for a basic income. And uh, I'm, I'm personally partial to rent sharing things like uh, the value of land, natural resources, and uh, legal um, and the ownership of, uh, of legally created entities. But um, for right now, I'm I just want to talk about basically just the income tax. Uh, in 2014, the total United States uh, um, domestic income uh, was, 16, um, was 16 trillion dollars and the uh, to just over 16 trillion, and the total population of the United States was just under 320 million, million. When you do the math, that gives us a mean income for every person in, in America of roughly $50,000. 
Now, in the 1950s and 60s, which were considered big boom economic years uh, for, for the United States, during the 50s, we had a top income tax rate of 90%. During the 1960s, we had, for most of the 1960s, there was a top income tax rate of 70%. Right now, the top income tax rate is 39.5%. So you could have a basic income for every man, woman, and child in the United States on top of all other spending just, by, um, just with a, uh, an across-the-board increase in, in income tax of 20%. And the result would be that we would have a top tax rate of 59.5%, which would still be far less than what we had in the, um, in the 50s and 60s. In fact, you could give every man, woman, and child um, 20,000 a year uh, with a 40% increase in the, in the, in the um, and people at the top tax bracket would still be able to keep twice the amount of the money um, that they were able to keep during the boom years of the 1950s. On the, fee on the feasibility issue, uh, on the political feasibility issue, in 1972, both Richard Nixon and um, uh, the Republican uh, incumbent and the Democratic nominee George McGovern had versions of a basic income as part of their campaign platforms. Uh, and, um, uh, and Nixon's proposal, um, the, which was known as the, um, the, uh, um, the family's, uh, uh, name's escaping me, but the, the family assistant plan, the FAP, it, um, it, it even passed the House of Representatives. That's how close we were to eradicating poverty, to abolishing poverty in, um, in my lifetime in 1972. In 1988, uh, two men in Indiana uh, applied, for a, um, uh, applied for a license to get married. Not only were they obviously denied then, but they were, um, but they were fined $2,800 and the judge uh, called their claims about Indiana law and constitutional rights are wacky and sanctionably so. But gay rights activists worked their asses off and with, almost, and with nearly all of human history against them, in one generation, uh, same-sex marriage um, as a constitutional right went from being sanctionably wacky um, to recognized by the Supreme Court. Right now, um, there has been a, a uh, for the past two years, there's been a surge of interest in, in basic income. There, um, there was a, uh, a referendum on it, which lost, but, um, but, uh, but did get significant support in, um, in Switzerland. There, um, the, the, the Finnish government and the, and the Canadian government are planning their own um, uh, um, pilot projects on it. And, um, the Y com combiner, uh, Y combinator, I think it's called, um, in a uh, group in Silicon Valley is going to be trying within the next year, they're gonna be starting a, a project uh, uh, on a pilot project here in Oakland. Now, do I think it could be, ha a basic income could happen in five years? No, I don't, but 20 years is more than feasible, and even if it takes 50 years to abolish poverty, that will be worth it. That Thank would definitely you. be worth it. Sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and interrupt because I want other people to have time. Let's really try to stay under five minutes because we want as much interaction as possible. We want to break people out of their shells and ways of thinking and people in this crowd, I'm sure are amenable to many views on the board. So Andreas, if you could go quick with the, with the thesis and, and our other two panelists yes. and then we can open it up to discussion. Is it possible to put the presentation on? Otherwise I can't, go, I can go without it, it's fine. Uh, Ideally, we would have, but right. I don't know. Cool, five minutes. All right, so yes, uh, basically I was thinking about it in terms of sort of like long-term future uh, and also medium-term ter future. Basically, is there any niche where humans will actually just continue to be uh, working there indefinitely? So basically, you can divide the economy into three very rough areas. There's obviously many ways of doing so, but... This is just one to illustrate where uh, our comparative advantage may be. So you have on the one hand the production of consumable products. Uh, that's almost certainly going to take, be taken over by uh, AI and, and, and machines. You also have administration, which to a large extent actually uh, happens to be a lot of uh, software engineering jobs 
which are basically automatizing a lot of administration that used to be um, very grueling. And that also will very likely be, ta be taken over. Um, the third area is basically exploration of consciousness. So art, uh, philosophy, and mathematics to a large extent are, to a large extent, th things that people are willing to pay others to do, to a large extent because doing that work is allowing you to explore your own consciousness. If there is a philosopher or an artist that creates something really interesting that actually tickles your own consciousness in a new and innovative way, you're willing to give that person uh, a particular amount of, of, of money and, and resources and, and so on. Um, so the question is, hey, like, will uh, machines be like, just better at tickling our pleasure centers, so to speak? And well, it could be, uh, but it ultimately depends on the actual nature of pleasure. And that's something that we don't really understand. And basically, there's two large options. Option number one, pleasure turns out to be something extremely simple. If you look at uh, the particular reward circuitry in the, in the human brain, you have the nucleus accumbens and the outer shell. Whenever you stimulate it, people experience a lot of bliss. This is not just superficial bliss. This is actual, like, really, really extraordinarily awesome experiences. Um, and it, it may turn out to be that, hey, pleasure actually reduces to some a biochemical, quantum, or functional signature that is extremely simple, like a pure tone or something like that. If that is the case, uh, yes, basically manufacturing pleasure on demand, on demand um, will not require any other sort of sentient uh, intervention or anybody to actually do the exploration for you. On the other hand, there is the possibility that actually there are different orders of pleasure. And a lot of people sort of like are eager to point out that basically the pleasure that you experience when you eat food or the pleasure that you experience um, with sort of the base pleasures, so to speak, they're not as good as the pleasure you can actually experience if you grasp a certain uh, mathematical proof just in the right way or philosophy or, um, or certain artistic experiences or obviously mystical, psychedelics, uh, meditation, and so on. Maybe those are genuinely actually hitting at something that is qualitatively superior to the kind of pleasure that we're used to. And if that is the case, then actually that would preclude the possibility for many non-sentient machines to ever explore that space, uh, at least to the same effectiveness as we are. Uh, simply because actually having a consciousness and experiencing from a first-person point of view everything that you're experiencing, and then cataloging, cata cataloging it, um, it's actually necessary to, to be able to um, identify these higher uh, orders of pleasure. And there is some precedent for that. We have uh, extraordinary psychonauts like uh, Sasha Shulgin, who demonstrated that you can be rational, but also explore the outer reaches of consciousness. Um, he actually developed uh, 200 new psychoactive drugs. He would start with extremely small doses and always report uh, everything he could about the effects, both subjective and physiological. Uh, he didn't go crazy, and he died when he was almost 90 years old. So this is something that, that can, be, can be done. And yes, basically, the kind of area or niche uh, that potentially, especially if there are higher orders of pleasure, that will be exclusively the terrain of sentient beings, uh, is what I call Super Shulgin Academies, or also uh, Manhattan Projects of Consciousness. Basically, large assemblages of extremely intelligent and bright uh, psychonauts who actually apply the rationality to catalog the extremely, extremely broad state space of possible conscious experiences and identifies hyper-valuable states in those areas, then kindle them and try to recruit them so that they get incorporated into our everyday consciousness. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. Edward? Hi. Um, is it on? Can, Can we get Edward's microphone on, please? Hello? Hello? All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take a, a contrarian position to some of the other speakers in that I don't think without uh, uh, changes to radical changes to our economic and political structures that um, robots will be taking our jobs. And um, my, my thinking on this goes back to basically some certain fundamental uh, principles that classical political economy has taught us regarding the, the nature of rent, the nature of uh, why it is that we, uh, we need labor, why it is that uh, uh, certain uh, capital gets employed in certain ways, and basically, 
um, uh, the, the two of the principles that I think are very important. The first is the law of comparative advantage. And basically the, the notion is that uh, people uh, who are better at everything, uh, still it's in their interest to trade with people who are worse at everything. Um, so, it, and it's true and it's mathematically provable that uh, there's higher total productivity when two uh, individuals uh, uh, Tra trade if they both specialize on what their comparative advantage is. So, so if the if the person is worse at, you know, uh, two two different skills, um, they focus on the one that they're less bad at relative to the other guy, and then the other guy focuses on what he's best at, and then the total output would be higher than if the 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 most efficient person sp split up all their uh, split up their time trying to p do some of the things that are. The, uh, uh, that, that are not quite as efficient, but still more efficient, then you know, they were wasting their time that they could be putting all of it towards the most efficient use of their time. So that is one segment. But the other thing is just you know, the, uh, you know, the business owners you know, and the roboticists, you just think about it from their perspective. Like, you know, are, are the, like the, business, the, the roboticists could figure out how to you know, um, wash your hands for you, but you know, is that really the best use of their time? It's not, you know, maybe they're gonna wanna focus on, you know, solving the greater problems. And so they're, they're gonna go where their profits are highest and the, and, the, and the business owners are only going to allocate resources to roboticists that are solving problems that are highly profitable. And uh, uh, likewise with the law of rent, uh, you, you notice that rents go up or down based on the productivity ad obtainable by the wage laborers in the region. So if labor becomes very, uh, you know, uh, like redundant in, in one area and people's uh, standard of living starts to decline, uh, they start to, they, they have less resources for the landlords to uh, collect from. So what you notice is the rent starts to decline and, there's, and this is what like standard of living is around the world when you hear the standard of living is lower. Uh, whatever, or their, their purchasing power parity is lower. What it really means is like, you know, they can get by on less, um, uh, and so uh, uh, if, if robots ever did start taking jobs, what you would notice is the rents would actually start to go down until a new equilibrium was set when um, now it's now more, more cost effective to hire individuals, and you see this actually uh, what, what outsourcing is actually termed de-automation. And you can look this up, there's outsourcing textbooks talking about the virtues of de-automation where you, where you ship off uh, highly mechanized factory jobs overseas to third world unskilled laborers who are cheaper. It's more profitable for the company to hire the unskilled laborers. And these sorts of questions, I think, don't become irrelevant even under uh, very uh, advanced uh, notions of what could be possible with artificial intelligence in the future and so on because basically uh, these basic facts um, uh, don't change and as long as the ownership paradigms are remains intact, right, you know, uh, the, the, some land is, is only suitable for some purposes and some, you know, uh, unless Unless we're talking about like robots um, turning into Skynet and starting killing people and taking their land and jobs and stuff, okay, then robots are taking our jobs. But if we're assuming that uh, our economic system is in place, we're assuming purchases and voluntary transactions are happening and that's causing the changes we're talking about, I, I fundamentally don't see a, a way unless we consciously choose to, 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 to change it. And I actually think uh, basic income proposals are quite dangerous for the same law of rent uh, because basically adding uh, new income gives them more uh, resources from which to charge rents to people. And what you're doing is subsidizing landlords indirectly unless you're thinking very clearly about what it is you're really trying to do here. Thank you for all stating your opinions, and I think it's great that we have uh, some disagreement on this stage because that makes for a more interesting discussion. So the question we're dealing with is, are robots going to take our jobs? And I would say yes. 
if the question is, when is the robot going to take my job, I would answer that depends, and I can go into more detail on that. But first of all, we can think, yes, we can do trade if I'm better at driving and I can stay up 10 hours without a rest and you can stay up eight hours without a rest. We can trade our skills and I can do the driving for you and you do the cooking for me because I'm terrible at cooking. Um, this is how the economy has worked so far and I think the, um, the way the economy works so far is not our safety but is the precise reason why we're going to get into trouble. Because if there's an alternative there that can just, like I said before, go a thousand hours without stopping, no human is going to compete with that. So this trade between humans collapses with the third alternative that will just outcompete all of that. And we've seen this before, and um, people bring up often examples of, yeah, humans used to do all these manual labor jobs, and now they do other jobs, so there will always be jobs. Um, let's think about horses. So at the turn of the 19th century, 18th century, uh, 19th to 20th century, millions of horses were employed all over the US and Europe and, and Asia. They did a lot of manual labor, they did a lot of transportation, um, and then we invented motors and machines that can take over all this transportation and manual labor. And now we don't have that many horses employed anymore. They are like and with employed, of course, I mean slavery of horses because nobody actually pays them. But the point is that there was lots of work that horses were the best thing for getting it done. And now there is very little work that horses are the best thing for, for getting it done. With humans, this took much longer because we are much smarter, we can do much more things, we are much more versatile. So when manual labor was replaced with cognitive labor, that was great for us because we can do cognitive labor. We can say, oh, great, I don't have to use my arms anymore. I'm just going to use my head instead. But now we are at the point where we can replace cognitive labor. And then we might just go the way the horses went. There's just not that much more to do once cognitive labor is replaced. Um, and just to, just to uh, illustrate a little bit, if this works. Oh, yeah, it works. I'm going to skip over everything because you saw it already. OK, here we go. So I came up with an incomplete list of, all the, of a few of the jobs I've done already. I started working at the age of 13, so I had a lot of time to do things and thought to myself, which ones would be replaced today by machines? So those are the, the two on the left side. By the way, all the things on the left side are things I've done before my 18th birthday. So shelf stalker, machines can already do that. Um, hardware assembler, lots of machines do that. Actually, when I was stocking shelves in a pharmacy back then, the owner of the pharmacy was considering an offer of having a robot stock the shelves and completely replacing me. And the only reason she didn't do that was because the robot was very expensive and she only paid me six bucks per hour, so I was very cheap. Um, but the cost of these robots has been falling dramatically. So at some point, it just doesn't make sense anymore to not buy these robots. Now, the orange ones are the ones that all can theoretically be done already, and there's already a lot of automation going on that makes this work so much easier that instead of needing, you know, 100 jobs in one city or 1,000 jobs of this particular kind in one city, you can do it with fewer jobs because they're so efficient or they just have a lot of help, or you can theoretically build things that do it. And then the last one is where you where it would turn yellow. It's a little bit hard to say, but those are the jobs that are also getting easier with more and more hardware that helps this. So the overall takeaway from this is, when is my job going to be taken? It depends. If you do manual labor, it might be automated earlier. If you do cognitive, it will be later. Um, but in the long term, uh, humans might retire the same way that horses did once we had things that were better at manual labor. And now we have things that are better at cognitive labor. Great. Thank you all so much. So I want to open it up for about 10 minutes and just react to the most interesting, important points that other members of the panel uh, said that you, maybe you disagree with. Um, we want to do that in a friendly way, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, the, the point of this is to to have a really engaging conversation and poke holes in maybe some of the short-sightedness of 
what you might perceive the other person to be thinking. And then after that, I'd like to open it up to the audience for Q&A. So anything really inflammatory or interesting that we ought to address right now? Uh, well, I wanted to address the, the basic income uh, um, argument against your, your Talk oh, more directly. Uh, address your argument against abolishing poverty. Um, because I, 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 as I understand it, what you're saying is that there's more money out there and that's just going to be captured as land rent. Is that what you're saying? Uh, or, because if you're just talking about a general inflation, um, then, then as long as the basic income isn't just done by printing up new money, uh, you should have the same uh, general amount of money out there if, there's, if it's paid for by taxes. And it, you just have different people with the money and you have people who can spend it, but, they can, um, but that, would, that, that generates demand and that, um, uh, and, and that fuels the economy rather than just relying on, um, uh, ra rather than just putting more money in there to, um, to raise rent, to raise rents on everything. Um, with land specifically, now I, I actually happen to agree with a land tax and I, there's a possibility that, um, that more money coming in is going to, is going to be captured by the uh, landlords, which is why you need a land tax, but there's also the possibility we don't know what the distribution of, um, of rents, uh, particularly land rents, would look like if there was no poverty. Why is, why is land in the middle of, 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 of Oakland and then in the middle of San Francisco so much more than what you, why is the rent so much more than what you'd find in Fresno? It's because there are jobs here and people need to be here in order to live. If people could live, had the money to live wherever we want, wherever they wanted to, we have no idea, honestly, right now what the um, distribution of people would be and, and where land rent would be expensive. And then my final point would just be empirically that there has been a small, not, not sufficient, but a small basic income in, um, in Alaska uh, since the early 80s and there's no evidence that that, that significantly in, increased rents pr or prices compared to what it was in Alaska before or compared to Saskatchewan, which is right next to it. Uh, um, one thing I just wanted to say is um, I think a lot of the technological projections about decreasing costs uh, or, or uh, technological unemployment or any of these things rely on a sort of uh, quantitative look at the costs of things and you go, okay, well, you know, it's now uh, more efficient to produce uh, X quantity of widgets and so therefore the price is going down, and therefore, you know, the uh, and, and and that kind of thing. Like you add up the input costs, and you're like, okay, well, the input costs are now cheaper, so everything's cheaper, and that's that. You know, that's efficiency, right? And but then you look at how the real economy works, and you go, okay, well, some areas, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about what probably is the most relevant part of technological employment, which would be like the general average worker with no particularly amazingly special skills uh, that are marketable, you know, they, they, they uh, are, you know, looking for work, are they going to have a job in the future? That's the relevant question, because maybe there's always going to be, you know, the special basketball player or something who's got some special skill and they, they can re rec receive uh, a, a, a super, you know, a, a above average return for their, their work, but you know, for the average person, you, you, you notice also differences regionally for them. So you notice, um, you know, in San Francisco, even uh, lowly jobs in San Francisco nominally pay much higher f uh, uh, than it would in the middle of Kansas, right? And they're the same job, but just in the two different locations, they're going to receive a much different wage. And why is that? So, so like for instance, um, uh, an example I, I heard of was uh, when the oil boom in North Dakota was going on, unskilled laborers could go there and maybe get a wage of 100000 a year with no college or high school education even, you know, if they could, were willing to go dr drill oil out there. And uh, there was a, a boom, and uh, I believe it was Williston, North Dakota, I believe it was the, the town. Uh, and uh, it, it just exploded. The whole town 
um, was in a frenzy and uh, ironically enough, all the people going heard that they'd get $100,000, didn't realize they'd be paying like $3,000 a month in rent. In fact, it became the, the single highest, uh, most expensive place to rent in the whole country, higher than San Francisco, in the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. And, uh, the, you know, uh, and even McDonald's wages out there in Williston were like over 20 an hour for you know, people to sweep the floor. And uh, why is it that in North Dakota, it, it, they, uh, floor sleep sweeps were worth $20 an hour and somewhere else they're worth $5 an hour, you know? And it's like, it's the same job, but we're not, we're, when we're saying we're automating labor, we're not recognizing that actually access rights, monopoly privileges, the, the ability to access the prime locations uh, uh, it seems to, uh, be uh, the driving force setting the rate of wages and, uh, and the rents adjust accordingly and the wages adjust accordingly based on uh, sort of what they can force you to pay. Or, and and uh, I, I just don't see a way around uh, that by just giving people more money because it almost falls into the same trap because in a place like North Dakota where money is falling from the trees in Williston at, at one point, it's not actually substantively helping people as much as they might think because the rents are now eating up such a large portion of that, that, uh, that uh, money. So the, the key to me, if you want a sustainable system that you know, uh, shares the, the rising uh, advances of civilization, you need to account for the fact that the access rights, the monopoly privileges, the uh, seem to be the power, that seems to be the root of the power relationship, you know. Can I respond to that? So you made a, a very good point about access right and monopolies, and that um, might be a part of the problem that we're facing here, that they are not, you know, in, in the hands of all of us, but they're in the hands of a few individuals who can greatly profit from that. And um, I've worked as a management consultant at McKinsey and & Company, and we would go to um, S&P 500 companies, very large billion dollar corporations, and then help them figure out whatever they wanted to figure out. And one thing I learned is that deep down, when it comes down to it, corporations do not really care about people. They care about only one thing, which is the stock price and the bottom line. And that's even a law. Um, executives can be, can be fired and can even be sued for doing something that does not increase the stock price, even they could have done that. So with that in mind, um, right now, the example that you brought up with the very expensive place because there was an oil rush, um, first of all, we can't just all rely on an oil rush. That is a very special situation where only few people get to benefit from it. And the other thing is the reason why employers paid so much money is because they had to. They just needed people there. They just couldn't get the oil out of the ground if they didn't have something that got the labor done. Now, once we have technology, for example, for a self-cleaning bathroom at McDonald's, they will install the self-cleaning bathroom. They will not continue paying wages to people who do that um, if they don't have to. Right now, it's just because we, the technology is not just there yet to replace all humans there. Um, but we're not just talking about something that is in the far future. We are already seeing effects of this around us, especially the younger generation. When, when you see a, a young person who's just out of college talk with somebody from the previous generation, what were things like when they got out of college, they might paint a very different picture. And many of those jobs that they might have done as summer jobs during college and paid their way, um, they might just not be around anymore because there's um, just not enough work to go around for everyone. So if, you know, if right now there's 40 hours for everyone, that's how much work we need to get done. And if that pie shrinks, yeah, we can always find the, like, the cherries with the oil rush, but if the pie overall is smaller, what are we gonna do about that? So the consensus seems to be that whether all the jobs will be taken by robots or not and how long that will take is unclear. Uh, sort of uh, low skill, um, low education type jobs seem to be, it's, there's a great case from what I can tell uh, to be made for, you know, that automation will, you know, just keep 
taking more of those jobs. So one really relevant question out of all of this is how do we uh, alleviate human suffering? How do we deal with, with the fact that we are transitioning toward something like that? Um, and how, how, do, how do we improve people's lives the most given this dynamic? I want to keep this short. I think the first thing we need to consider is that the idea that a person needs to have a 40-hour work week in order to be a valuable member of society is something that has been invented fairly recently and they, that we might want to give up on at some point in the future. My response would be uh, better antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I definitely think we should abolish poverty whether uh, technological unemployment happens or not. I mean, I, defi I, I, I definitely see it happening. Um, and even if it doesn't happen, we're, what we're going to enter is a period where you can't plan the future, where you, um, even, if there are, even if we still need people to do some jobs, you don't know 10 years from now if the skills you have are going to be useful. And so you, you need a floor to step, fall back on while you're retraining the five, the five or six times during your life you'll need to eat un, until technological unemployment happens. Um, but either way, even if nothing changes, Poverty is injustice and needs to be abolished. Um, yeah, and I agree that poverty is an injustice. It should be abolished, but I, 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 I actually am skeptical still of, of the premise that robots will take even low-skill jobs per se. What I, what I think is that um, r robots can do almost all the tasks, but I don't think ac the economy really accounts for that kind of thing, and I think the way the way it would play out is is much different. But I think the 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 way to, the best way that I know of to solve it that would be sustainable would be uh, something very similar, a form of basic income called the citizen's dividend. But it would be scaled to the rent rental values that are collected from the rising general prosperity of, of, the, of the community, and then it would. Uh, there would be no ceiling for how high it could go, but the floor could be actually zero, depending on whether there is any rent left over uh, out of the common pool of rent. Yeah, that's collected. So, so, in other words, what you're saying is, in a place like San Francisco Bay Area, we've got rapidly increasing technology that is causing uh, gentrification, it's causing displacements, uh, it's causing rent to rise, and saying we need a basic income, but how we pay for that basic income is important. And if you were to simply recollect the value of the, you know, the rising real estate prices, then that would be a great way to fund it, um, as opposed to doing things. You know, we heard Chuck Marone earlier today talk about how harmful the sales taxes are, because uh, you know, whether you're rich or poor, you pay the same rate as you know, someone who, who makes much more than you, um, and some of these other regressive taxes. So that seems to be what Edward's saying, and um, it's, it's a small critique, but I, I'm also interested more in this idea that you think robots will not take even the low-level jobs. I, I still don't understand the... Yeah. Uh, well, if, if you want to just give some examples, like uh, uh, you, you see sweatshops to this day that could be easily replaced by robots, and, and you see um, uh, factories literally closing down that have lots of robots and being shipped off to places where, you know, they're, they're, there's just unskilled, low-paid laborers. And um, this sort of trend, uh, to me, happens as a result of this purchasing power parity issue where, you know, yeah, they can live at a much cheaper rate in certain countries uh, and achieve a, 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 an amicable standard of living just because the, the, the rental value of land out there is just so much cheaper and, and all the products across the board and where, where they are reflect this, uh, not just their, their apartments. And so you go to San Francisco or Oakland or something, and you notice, you look around, and everything costs twice, three times more than it costs in other places in the same country. And um, you notice the value of unskilled labor here is higher. And it doesn't, it doesn't make sense why a street sweeper in Oakland is worth more than a street sweeper in Kansas, but it is the case that a street sweeper here and it's not just a, a short-term oil boom or tech boom or something. It's like a, 
it's a perma problem that like er certain areas have uh, higher wages for even low skill, and you can't get around it. Uh, should we let uh, Timothy? Please, I, I was, was going to ask you how how, how, how you would respond to my. To, to my argument that uh, in because uh, since we're focusing on robots here um, that even if we're not at technological unemployment and even if that doesn't happen for 200 years that what we're entering is not a temporary disruption and then we'll have all the jobs settled out for the next three or four generations but, but rather we are entering a, a period of constant change in that um, in in that for the next let's call it 200 years, let's say, if that's how long you think it, how long it may be before the robots can do everything. Um, we're, it'll be constant change and nobody can plan their career. Nobody can expect that their skills that they have now will be needed in 10 years. Do you, do, um, I mean, do, do you, would you agree with the, that? And if so, what would you do about it? I think there's something uh, called like disruptive tech, where it, it quickly changes things and quickly puts a lot of people on their f uh, out on the street or whatever, and they, they, their skills are now useless and they have to retrain. And there's this sort of temporary displacement effect that I think is a very real thing that technology has and will create. But uh, I just don't see uh, uh, the sort of permanent robots have taken all our jobs uh, no, there's no more jobs ever. That, like, that's a, that I don't see as being a likely outcome. Can, Let's let Julia can, can, respond to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also want to open it up to the audience in a moment because I uh, want to keep this conversation going in other directions too. Um, one example is you gave the street sweeper example, and that's something we can very obviously see that 100 years ago, street sweepers were you know, several people with broomsticks and with the little things that you shovel things in. And now it's just one or two people with a truck and they can sweep a street in five minutes instead of an hour. Um, so with this, you know, already the demand for street sweepers is lower, not just here, but across everywhere. And I like the idea of universal income. And one point that it makes is that it is also um, an issue of, of freedom and liberty because if we say, oh, all the poor people, we're just going to give them free housing and then we're going to give them some free food, then they're basically bound to whatever handouts we have for them. But if we give everyone an income, people are free to choose where they want to move, what they want to do with the rest of their money so they can, they can shift markets and they can vote with their dollars, so to speak. So we are giving... We are giving um, not just the sustenance, but we are also giving a little bit of self-reliability and, and power to make choices back to people. Uh, um, can, can I ask him a question? Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so as, as I understand what you're saying is that if, if, if we have comp more complex, um, uh, if humans have a more complex idea of pleasure um, rather than just simple stimulate this, this area, which I think you're, which I believe you're, it is more complex than that. And you're saying that then that leaves something that only people with a consciousness can do and that's what they can, th that's how they can earn their money. Um, my, my, my question though is that those things that you're talking about that people would do, going into the arts or maybe discovering in sciences and things like that, that seems to me the kind of thing that people would want to do anyway if they retired for free. Right. So I don't see how that is a base, things that people want to do for free as a basis for everybody doing um, uh, as uh, getting income. Maybe the stars, it would, the, the, the star system then would seem to be even, even more so. You'd have a few stars who make a lot of money, but everybody else is just doing a hobby, and how do they get paid? Right. Um, yes, uh, so the, the pleasure uh, example is, um, Yes, like pleasure may, may turn out to be biologically very simple. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it seems to be the case that pretty much all forms of higher pleasure really are different ways that the cortex has to actually activate the same pleasure centers. And if you damage those pleasure centers, unfortunately, no amount of poetry or, or amazing music will actually make you feel good. Um, however, th there is like an empirical question about whether pleasure uh, could be could be sort of like implemented in different ways or whether there are like higher forms of it that normal human consciousness just doesn't access but humans in different states of consciousness uh, can access. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what, what, what the point about the uh, sort of like if they want to do it anyway, uh, what, what, what is the concern there? Uh, my, my, my concern is that only the few stars 
in the um, in in science or arts are going to really get paid. Everybody else is doing it in producing. Like you know, you can you can read fanfic novels forever, and and there are people who have written it for free, and you can enjoy that for free. And I don't see how that translates to people being able to monetize it. Oh yeah, no, that, that's that's totally true. I guess like. The, the, the view I was, I was painting in terms of uh, the future of jobs is in a sense very bleak in the sense that yes, like no. if okay. uh, consumable products and administration is just out the window for, for humans to do, then what remains is these um, few areas such as consciousness exploration. And yes, it, it will be the case that 99% of the discoveries are made by 1% of the people who do the explorations. And in that sense, it's going to be ex extraordinarily unequal in terms of who, who will have a sort of something that anybody would be interested? I mean, basically, once you reverse engineer pleasure, th there's nothing you have <laughs> that somebody would be interested uh, out of you, unless you can actually provide even better pleasure. Okay, interesting. Why don't we open it up for um, questions? I'm going to run down to you and hold the mic. I just wanted to respond to what you said about North Dakota, which is if everybody had a basic income, not as many people would be rapidly flocking to the oil fields in North Dakota. So that would be a significant shift. And also, I think that you, you might want to do a little more uh, research into how rapidly AI is advancing because those jobs aren't going to be there. They're not going to be there. And, and I live in Berkeley. And in Berkeley, a business right now is in the process of getting permits. And people will not interact with human beings at all to buy food and get their meals. They'll get them from little boxes. And right now, they still plan on using humans to assemble the food, but they are in the process of mechanizing that as well. And that's happening right now, today, in Berkeley, California. Hey, well, why don't we take a few, and then you guys can respond collectively. So his question, after, after him, Frank. OK. So the, Martin, Ford, <coughs> Martin Ford wrote a book called Lights in the Tunnel. I think he has a new book. And, and, and he's, he talks about the idea that once consumers go away and, and their jobs are automated away, that really that kind of causes a collapse of the economy because there's no one to buy any of these goods. And that, um, I don't know if people have addressed that. I mean, I think, yeah, this idea that this wouldn't happen um, addresses it. But if, if we do have this very high automation, the lack of consumers kind of poses a problem for um, a consumer-based economy, right? One more, and then discuss, and then we'll form it back out to the audience. Um, I'm going to introduce the concept of, well, I'm going to ask how many people have heard of the game Do Sex, and the concept of transhumanism, where we hybridize machines and humans together, and how that may play in terms of the nature of work, income, um, and economies and how that might play out. If you so. can't beat them, join them. Yeah. That could, apply to the machines. that could apply to the machines as well. Yeah. Do you guys want to collectively reply to those, take more? Yeah. Why don't you reply? I, I would like to um, answer to the gentleman over here, Scott Jackish, about the threat of an economic collapse. And I think this is a very real thing that we're facing. And we've seen this before several times in history where in an economy worked very well for a while and then it worked so well that it kind of steered against the wall. Um, one example is Germany in about 100 years ago where um, the, feel, the general feeling was that employment was going down and the other feeling is we used to be someone in the world, now we're not someone anymore and we, we can buy with our money as much as we want and all these things. And what it led to was the rise of nationalism and fascism in the country. And I see a similar threat in the US right now where people who feel disenfranchised and feel disappointed with the way their lives have gone, which they didn't expect that way, um, are more likely to listen to people who make them promises that are based on fascism and nationalism. And that is one of the first warning signs for a possible war or an economic collapse or any of these things that we, that any instability that um, we're seeing on the horizon. Yeah, the, 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 the argument that um, 
that without consumers, without people making money, um, we don't need to worry about that because things will be produced and, and the prices will go down because there aren't people buying. What you're talking about is severe, de is severe, is a severe deflationary period where, um, and, and that is, that is absolutely, that, that's an economic collapse right there because um, who's going to invest if, um, if their money is worth more, if they just hold on to it. If, um, if, if prices are going down, that's when everything stops and that's when you have a, a, a complete collapse. So I, 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 don't, I don't see that as a solution. Um, I, I did like the question about transhumanism. I thought that was a, a one logical response to, to any sort of um, problem like this. And, and, but you have seen this sort of um, like economic treadmill speeding up throughout the course of the, in, the industrial revolution and onwards, where you know you have the th the things getting more efficient, and so everyone has to you know work harder. So we're not working four-hour days to get the same level of efficiency. We're, uh, we're working the same amount of time to get a higher level of total production, and um, so 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 uh, and then. You know, when um, the housework goes down because of uh, washing machines and stuff, then women enter the workforce. To me, to me, that had much more to do with it than feminism did, uh, ju just because it was such a logical response to this free time uh, to, to use it to make money. And, uh, but these things, you, you add them on top of each other. You get a college degree. You have a two-income household. They, go, they quickly go from, you know, uh, you running ahead of the pack to you just needing to do this to just to keep pace with everyone else and I think this sort of trend will continue I think people will get enhancements they'll get greater technology access and they'll use this access to become more productive and then work the same amount of hours that they were before uh, just to stay where they w were economically and uh -huh. but I think that's I think that's the general trend that we've seen and I think it, we, it won't change barring some sort of fundamental shift in the low level. Um, I, 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 I would say in terms of, of enhancements and, and becoming cyborgs and mel melding with the machines, that um, we also need to look at it and make sure that as it happens, it happens in a just economically democratic way. Um, other, otherwise, the, the ability of people who are highly skilled and, you know, right now people who are rich can, uh, can, can get more skills to earn money. When, 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 it, when you get to the point where those people can then enhance themselves to be even more skillful and, 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 and be quicker, um, there, there's a potential, there, there's a potential in transhumanism for a, a great, wonderful, egalitarian society where everybody is enhanced and everybody um, can, can express who they really are. And there's also the potential for a dystopian, complete inegalitarian nightmare. So we have to be careful. So we've got about five minutes. I want to take two more questions and uh, let's try to wind it up. Sure. Cool. I like that. Cool. So uh, I just want to quickly respond to the point that was made earlier about the Alaska fund. Uh, that fund specifically was raised out of, so that's basically just, that was basically just raised out of rents on oil. And so in a sense, that's part of why uh, the, that's part of why the actual, you know, the aggregate rents that happened in Alaska haven't gone up too much. Uh, but that's more of just a, that was more of just like a quick segue into the question I had was, uh, y you see that uh, there's lots of questions regarding 40 hour work or you know work weeks shortening and shortening and there have been a lot of you know debates throughout history uh, you know kind of evolving out of the Protestant work ethic uh, and I think the question more of an open question I have is uh, will that take you know will that transition to shorter work weeks uh, or you know closer to you know closer to less works in a society and more leisure time will that come out of sort of grassroots social action as though like unions have you know unions claim partly uh, the, you know, limits on work weeks, or will that come out of you know, advancements in technology, or would it be some, like, or would it be some composite of the two? I guess that's my question. Let me get Thomas over here to answer, ask one more question, and then we will respond, and that will be the end of it. Did I have my hand up? Who else had their hand up? I thought Thomas had their hand up. Anyone? Lawrence, OK. To uh, continue with uh, 
the uh, transhumanism and integrating robots into our lives, uh, whether they're going to take our jobs or not. Um, do we really want proprietary corporations doing this? Or maybe other options are better, such as open source. Could you speak to that, please? How would you do open source? I think it's been one of the themes Lawrence and I have talked about. OK, so five minutes, and then let's wind it up. Um, I, I'd like to take the, with, with the first gentleman, as much as I was able to hear, uh, one of the questions had to, uh, one had, had to do with the Alaska um, uh, uh, dividend and the fact that that comes out of the natural resources. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by the, the what, what, why you think that that in, in theory shouldn't have um, increased uh, prices. I mean, because I, I think in theory it should because before before the the um, the dividend, the you just had the wealth was just in the ground and nobody was using it, and if it wasn't for the dividend, um, a large portion of that wealth would have just been taken by corporations that would have spent it everywhere else in the world instead of Alaska. So it really did actually increase the amount of money that's being spent in Alaska, with, but it really didn't have, a, have yet a noticeable effect on, um, on, on prices. Um, and as for the work week, I, I didn't entirely hear that question, but I can tell you that um, e experiments with basic income have shown in, um, in, in countries where people are generally overworked, um, where, where you know, they did experiments on um, in, um, poor people who generally uh, have dual or triple incomes in the family, and the primary worker works, um, works more than... Um, uh, than, uh, than 40 hours a week, there was reduction in how much people worked just naturally from, from, from getting the basic income, but not to the point where you got, uh, so teenagers who were previously uh, working stopped working and secondary workers stopped working, but primary workers, nobody's just, no primary worker just stopped. The um, average amount of the, that a primary worker worked earning a basic income was still slightly higher than, than 40 hours a week. In countries where they've done experiments that have had extreme poverty because people don't have a job, actually work increased because people used it to, um, to, to um, become in, uh, entrepreneurs and start their own jobs. Uh, I, I think what happens is that naturally people want to spend a certain amount of their time in, um, in productive work and a certain amount of their time at leisure, and they'll use whatever money they have to achieve that balance. I, I wanted to respond to Lawrence's question about open source. Um, uh, not to be a downer again, uh, but I tend to uh, think open source has only very narrow use cases that t typically it's really good for solving well-defined concrete problems that there's not a lot of subjective differences about how it ought to be achieved. So, you know, it's very good for creating, you know, uh, a, a math engine or like a, an oper uh, or like a particular piece of uh, reverse engineered software, you know, that you're just re-implementing something by the book step by step and, you know, if there's any questions, refer to the book, right? It, and it works really well for that. So I've seen countless reverse engineering projects that are really successful in the open source community. But what you don't see is path-breaking, visionary ideas that are going to rustle a lot of feathers and make a lot of people uncomfortable because how do you design by committee some groundbreaking, out-of-the-box thing? You just can't. Uh, and so the, the future sort of trajectory to me seems to be that you have uh, these two competing forces. The first is you have some path-breaking, groundbreaking idea that get, uh, gets pushed forward by some ingenious, you know, entrepreneur, visionary artist, author, and then you have a reverse engineering of that slowly over time as the patents expire or as the copyrights expire and they slowly get it reverse engineered. Even Linux is actually just a reverse engineering of the Unix operating system's basic principles. You know, so um, I can't think of a, a major example in open source that really is totally new, um, with maybe one exception of Wikipedia, which is a fantastic uh, resource. We're, we're very low on time, so short statements from both of you, if you'd, if you'd like to chime yes. in. Um, 
I need to do a short answer on open source because Foresight Institute, one of the founders is also the person who coined the term open source, Christine Peterson. She's actually in the audience today. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, thank you for that, Christine. Um, uh, open source is, is very important to us and to the world because it is something that grows the pie, so to speak at no marginal cost. So if you create something and you put it into the world with open source, other people can use it and nobody is poorer by doing that. So when we think about the pie, we grow it with open source. Um, and then to the question about why is not just everyone going to work um, fewer hours? Um, the, qu the thing about that is efficiency. So I said earlier that corporations always want to maximize their profits. For them, it's more profitable to have one person who works 40 hours and does the whole job than to have two people who do it part-time and then they need to coordinate and you don't know who's doing what and who is which data and so forth. So you lose efficiency when you have more people. Now the government has worked actively to improve the situation by um, introducing um, overtime payment so that you get extra pay and um, also protection of holidays, protection of the weekend, the Sunday especially. Um, and these are efforts to already get there. Ford was one of the, maybe the only uh, real industrialists who uh, by himself introduced less time so that his employees can go out and drive the cars they were building. Um, and when we think about the universal income, if it's something that we're not yet ready for, that from, from now to all of a sudden we want to change everything, um, having better work protection and doing laws that reduce the overall workload might be a path to that in certain cultures. Um, European cultures and American cultures are all different and there might be a backlash here in certain areas about even more government oversight. But overall, it is one of the viable ideas that could lead to the post-work society. Yeah, uh, I guess just like to wrap up, uh, yes, uh, if, if we uh, were in control of our reward circuitry, then open source would work every time. Basically, when, when, like there's this, um, we are wired to basically look for social reward, and in the absence of it, we look for things such as uh, actual uh, power or uh, money. So. Uh, as long as an open source system actually allows for uh, basically social reward and recognition of who made contributions that, that can work very well. Uh, it may not work when there's very unclear or just probabilistic assessments of who, who made contributions. But once we rewire our uh, reward circuitry, basically we can get rid of all of our strange inherited uh, uh, methods that we use to actually feel good, such as being recognized by others. And, and then, yes, uh, open source will work just <laughs> indefinitely. Yeah. I want to point out that it, um, we started out as being on polar opposites of this conversation. And over the course of this conversation, it seemed to have worked out that way that all four of us are in favor of some kind of method of alleviating poverty, of making sure that people have um, a life of dignity even if they're not working 40 hours or even if, if they don't have like highly paid skills. And I just wanted to you know, observe that and, and point that out. Definitely. Those are great yeah. closing statements. Thank you to all the panelists. And uh, we'll get started with the next session. Let's take a quick uh, like five minute break, get something to drink.